And there's a little step. Sorry. All right, I'll start again. We're going to talk about some common problems today. The, and we're, Dr. Shaked's going to talk about the surgical treatment. I'm going to talk about the conservative treatment. So there's the list, and we're going to go through each one. Um, next slide. Thank you. So the first one I'm going to talk about is Achilles tendonitis. And that's normally inflammation over the tendon. So it's either going to be just right before it inserts into the heel bone, which is the calcaneus, or it's going to be right where it inserts into the calcaneus. And what, a lot of times when it, it happens right on the heel bone, we're gonna see inflammation on the heel bone itself. And sometimes you'll even see a spur. It's, you'll see the swelling and you'll have a lot of pain and tightness to the area. Next slide, please. So pain occurs, it starts out very mild first. And you can see it when you first get up in the morning or after sitting down and getting up. In my runners, what I'll see is they'll say, you know what, it hurts a little bit after I stop running. It's not hurting when I'm running. They, they're gonna feel that tightness, that pain, and then they'll start seeing swelling, right? And we see it in runners that have increased the Maybe they are now running longer and more mileage, or all of a sudden they start running faster and they've increased their intensity. It's also common in middle-aged patients or also people who have very tight Achilles tendon. I'll see it in patients who maybe are just weekend warriors, play basketball on the weekends. They're not in good condition. They're not stretching. And all of a sudden they're playing and, all, and they just have this severe pain in their Achilles tendon. Next slide, please. So the non-operative treatment is the first thing I'll ask the patient is, you know, what are your activities? I'm gonna to try to find out why they have it. So is it something that they're doing? Is it something that they're wearing? So I'm gonna ask them what shoes they're wearing. If it's an athlete, I'm gonna ask them, are your sneakers new or, or are they over 300 to 500 miles? Sometimes the, the reason why you get Achilles tendonitis is because you're wearing shoes that aren't absorbing the shock when you're walking or when you're running. So once we can figure out what causes it, then we're gonna start talking about a treatment. And first thing I'll start is have them start stretching the Achilles tendon. And there are different types of stretches that I'll go over with you with it. I will have them ice it and use some anti-inflammatories. I'm gonna talk again about the shoes and the sneakers. If they are wearing no shoes at all, and with this pandemic, we've seen a lot of people working from home and aren't wearing any shoes, and we're seeing more problems with their foot. If they have a lot of pain and every step they take, I'm going to immobilize them in a specific boot. What we have is an Achilles tendon boot. It has wedges in it. It shortens the Achilles tendon to allow that Achilles tendon to stop pulling and get some inflammation out of it. We'll, we'll sometimes use night splints. So patients will wear night splint at night where it keeps the foot in a 90 degree angle and stops to stretch on that Achilles tendon. Once I can get you pain free, you know, if, if it's been so painful, I had to place you into a boot, I'm gonna then take you out of that boot and I'm gonna send you to physical therapy for some stretching. I'm then gonna kind of evaluate your biomechanics. Are you pronating too much? Are you supinating too much? Is that what's causing that tightness and that pain? I might then recommend orthotics, which are inserts for your shoes that are custom made for your particular problem. And I always tell patients, once I get them better, what are we going to do to prevent this from happening? Well, I'm going to still have you stretch at least once or twice a week to prevent that tightness from coming back. And if, you know, if patients are willing, I'll say take a yoga class once a week. If you've tried all conservative treatment options and nothing helps, I'm going to send you to surgery to see Dr. Chiquette. Next slide, please. All right, so surgery for Achilles tendonitis. Um, like Dr. Gika said, if you've tried everything and nothing else is working and the pain just keeps coming back, um, surgery is an appropriate option. The success rate is relatively good. Most patients have sustained relief um, after the procedure is done. So the surgery involves firstly removing the bone spur. You can see in this picture on the left, this patient has significant bone spurs. She's got bone spurs within the tendon itself near where it attaches to the heel bone. And she's got this large bone spur that's um, pushing right into the Achilles tendon. You can see how much swelling is happening here of her skin right over that spur. And then this is called a Haglund's deformity. This is 
the normal part of the heel, but in some patients it's a little more prominent and that can also push on the tendon and cause irritation. So in surgery, that is removed, all the bone spur within the tendon is removed, and even that spike sticking out here is all removed as well. So the first part of the surgery is the cleanup where you actually remove all the bone spurs. And then um, I usually will remove part of the tendon as well because a lot of the tendon is degenerative and unhealthy. So I take away whatever does not look healthy, um, and then you're left with um, a nice cuff of tissue that's healthy. Um, sometimes I'll even bring in the tendon that bends down the big toe because it lives right behind the Achilles tendon. Um, and I can transfer that to the heel bone so that it's like a little mini Achilles tendon there reinforcing the Achilles tendon in the back. The Achilles tendon is then repaired back to bone. I usually use small anchors for that. Um, and uh, then the recovery is a little bit lengthy, but once you get through it, most patients do really well. You know, most of the recovery is first involving the skin incision healing, then letting the tendon heal back to the bone. And then after all that time of healing, the calf muscle is pretty atrophied. So it will require a good amount of physical therapy to build the calf muscle back up so that you can get back to your activities. All right, we're gonna talk about ankle sprains now. So an ankle sprain is an injury that occurs to your ankle. And it usually occurs like if you miss a step and you roll your ankle outwards, if you miss the curb, or if you're out doing any sports and you suddenly just roll the ankle. And it's a stretching of the, or tear of the ligaments on the outside of the ankle. And sometimes it can be on the inside of the ankles, but most of the time the ankle sprain is a lateral ankle sprain instead of the medial. So the ligaments get stretched beyond their limits. So You'll have ligaments that just as you roll, it stretches and stretches, and sometimes you can even have a partial tear or a full tear, depending on the severity of the ankle sprain. Next slide. They're common in all age groups, and like I said, it could be a very mild ankle sprain or it could be a very severe ankle sprain. And when you look at that picture, that's a typical you know, presentation of an ankle sprain. The patient comes in, they have a lot of swelling on the outside of the ankle. You'll see bruising underneath of the ankle. Sometimes it radiates into the forefoot and sometimes on top of the toes, you'll see that. They come in complaining that it's very painful on the outside. It's painful to touch. It's painful to place any weight on it. And they'll sometimes say, you know what? It's very unstable. When I place weight on it, I feel like my foot's just gonna roll out. Next slide. So without treatment and rehab, an ankle sprain can actually weaken the ankle. It could cause chronic ankle sprains if you don't treat it properly and cause ankle arthritis too. Um, if, you know, when patients ask me, you know, well, do I really have to go to physical therapy? Do I really have to be immobilized? It's not that bad. And I'll say, you know, this becomes a chronic problem. So you might not feel that you need all this treatment that we're going to recommend, but I will have repeat patients come in, you know, oh, I should have done what you told me last year and now I'm back again. So if any physician, whether it's, it's myself or Dr. Shaket or anyone that treats you for an ankle sprain, listen to them. You really need that immobilization. You need that physical therapy. And I always tell, talk to people about the RICE protocol. It's the rest, ice, compression, and elevation. A lot of patients think, okay, I'm gonna take a couple days off and I can go back to my sports. It really takes a lot longer than a couple days for an ankle sprain to heal. Next slide. So treatment again, which I just talked a little bit about the treatment. What you're gonna do is, depending on the severity of the ankle sprain, whether I put you into a brace or a boot. If it's a severe ankle sprain, I'm gonna place you into a boot. I'm gonna use some crutches for a couple weeks. Usually the immobilization is about four weeks. So if it's a mild ankle sprain, I'm gonna put you in a brace for four weeks. You're gonna wear the brace all the time, except for sleeping and bathing. I'm gonna keep you out of all high impact activities. I'm not gonna let you do any running. I'm not even gonna let you do any swimming because you gotta kick that, so it's not gonna heal. Talked about that rice protocol, right? So that's the, the resting of it, the icing the first three days. It's very important that you ice. And I always recommend icing 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off for the first three days. Compression, that's either going to be the boot or the brace and elevation. And I ask you to elevate it above the level of your heart, which is very hard, hard to do, right? So I'll say, well, go sit on your couch, put two pillows on the arm of the couch and, and it'll elevate your foot that way. That gives you a lot, a lot of help relieving that swelling and relieving the pain. 
I also will use some anti-inflammatories to kind of get down that swelling. Once I get the swelling resolved and I get that pain resolved, and I think that you're ready, I will send you for physical therapy that's gonna strengthen those ligaments that have been stretched or partially torn. And that's gonna include proprioception, which is balance training, because once you have an injury to an ankle, your balance is always off a little bit. So when, you, when I send you to physical therapy, they're gonna give you strengthening exercises and they're gonna do a lot of balance exercises. If you have chronic ankle sprains, which turn into severe arthritis, or just the, the ligaments are completely torn and instability, I'm then gonna recommend that you see our surgeon. Next slide. So um, like Dr. Geekus was saying, in some cases, despite doing all appropriate conservative treatment and giving it a few months to see if the ligaments will heal, some patients will still have chronic instability where the ligaments, although they've healed, healed in a stretched out position, which means that the ankle joint is actually loose. Um, patients come in saying that they feel like if, even if they step on like a small pebble in a parking lot, they'll roll their ankle again. Um, so it's the case where patients experience frequent sprains, um, even with minor um, incidents. So those are the situations where surgery is sometimes um, beneficial. The surgery is relatively straightforward. It basically involves taking down the ligaments that are on the side of the ankle that are the ones that are typically sprained and reattaching them tighter. I usually reattach them with two little anchors that go into the bone and hold that cuff of tissue up to the um, bone in a tighter fashion. And then um, the newer way to do this is to add um, an extra suture that's attached by two anchors. You can see it here, this is an, a cartoon example. So the beige color here is the ligament repair, and then you add this extra suture over top connected with two anchors. And that sort of acts like a seatbelt over top of the ligament repair. So that's really changed my practice so that, um, whereas I used to not let like, patients wayfair on this new ligament reconstruction for, for about six weeks, with the extra suture that I placed now, patients can actually wait there as early as two weeks after surgery once the skin incision heals. And then this is the surgical picture. I hope nobody's eating dinner while they're watching this, but um, this is the suture overlying the ligament impair that really um, holds it nice and tight so that when you know patients can wait there early and we don't, allow, it, it, we don't worry about the repair stretching out. Um, it allows rehab to occur earlier and return to sport to be as early as like three to four months after surgery, which is um, really used to be unheard of. Um, so chronic ankle instability is something that does really well with surgery, but fortunately most ankle sprains don't even need this. 85% of the time the ankle sprain heals and patients do just fine. Um, but if, if they don't, then there's always surgery. <laughs> Let's talk about bunions. So the next Foot deformity is a bunion. Medical term is hallux valgus. So, you know, when patients come in, they, they complain about pain on the outside of the great toe. So a bump forms there and it's a progressive deformity. It does get worse over time, especially if the patient doesn't change their shoe gear. Um, sometimes we'll see that that large toe will push over into the second toe and you'll have changes on the second toe. Next slide. So patients usually come in, they complain about a red, swollen, painful, great toe joint. Um, they'll say, you know, it started and it wasn't that painful. And then as um, it progressed and got larger, now I all of a sudden I have a lot of pain there. Sometimes you'll even have like motion, that restricted motion in that great toe joint. So we need 65 degrees of motion in there. If this progressive to the picture on the that you see at the screen right now, we'll have limited motion in that great toe joint. It, how, you know, patients say, well, how did I guess this? So usually it's hereditary. You know, I'll ask them, did your mother, your father, your grandparents, anyone have it? And they can usually say, yeah, mom had it or grandmother had it, she had surgery. It could also be associated with an inflammatory condition like rheumatoid arthritis. And very rarely, but sometimes we'll see it because of an injury that occurred sometime during their lifetime. It is most definitely aggravated by heels or ill-fitting shoes. So if someone comes in and say, you know, I had this little mild bunion, but I wanted to wear heels. So I continue to wear heels. I know I wasn't supposed to. And now look how large my 
bunion has gotten. Well, those, those heels put a lot of pressure on the outside of that first metatarsal. It shifts that large toe over and it makes a larger bunion. The other shoes that are really bad for this are very flat, very narrow shoes. So any flat, narrow shoes or any high heels will aggravate this and make it worse. And then this is like a very severe case of a bunion where you see where that large toe went underneath that second toe. It creates a hammer toe. And if, if you look out on that second toe, you can even see a corn. So the patient can come in and they can have pain on that hammer toe. And they're like, well, the bunion's okay, but it's really the hammer toe. To address that hammer toe, sometimes the surgeon has to go in and correct the bunion along with the hammer toe because that, that the reason why you have the hammer toe is because the bunion. Next slide. And so treatment, you know, mostly all of the time is changes in your foot gear. So I'll ask patients, what shoes do you normally wear? When is the last time you've been measured? So, it, you know, surprisingly, most of us have not been measured for shoes since we were a child. So I always recommend patients go to a shoe store that has the Brannock device, the metal device that you can be measured on. So you have to stand up on the metal device. It gets the length of it and the width. And you'll be surprised how many of us are wearing the wrong size shoe or the wrong width shoe. So imagine having like a mild bunion and you're in the wrong width shoe. Now that shoe is too narrow, it puts more pressure on the bunion and it causes the bunion to get progressively worse. Also, I ask you to be measured at the end of the day because we all have a tendency to swell up at the end of the day, especially our feet and ankles. So that will give you a good idea of what size shoe you should really be. The other recommendation I'll make is if the shoe does not feel comfortable when you try it on, that is not a shoe for you to buy. A lot of times patients say, well, it didn't feel comfortable, but I thought, you know, not tomorrow will feel better, so they'll buy it because they like the shape, they like the look of it. Again, remember, if it doesn't feel comfortable when you try it on at the store, it's not meant for you. You also kind of want to avoid, you know, um, any shoe that is pointed, I'm sorry, yeah, pointed shoe. So if you look at the bottom, the best shoe, of course, is the squared shoe, which for most women, that's not the shoe that they want to be in. Um, but so if you, you know, are going to be wearing shoes most of the time and you don't have to wear heels, I would wear the square rounded shoes and then wear the heels if you have to go to a function. Next slide, please. We also like, I will recommend for patients who don't want surgery and have tried wider shoes, we can try to use some padding, like some bunion shields. So there's two different types. One is just where the shield is just over the bunion itself, right, which is on the lower left-hand side. Or you can use a shield which has a toe spacer, which is on the upper right-hand side. And the toe spacer will separate this, the first and second toes from each other, so preventing it from getting too close together. What I have to remind patients about these padding is, I am not going to correct the bunion. As long as you wear this pad, you'll have relief of pain. But the minute you take that pad off, that bunion's gonna come back. I'll have patients who will come in and they'll have bought a multitude of pads from Amazon. And they said, well, this says that it's gonna correct my bunion. And I'll try to you know, kind of compare it to like, if you need glasses to see a sign and you know you wear these glasses for a whole year and after a year you take that gla those glasses off can you see that sign any better no you need glasses to see the sign and that's kind of like with these pads as long as you wear them we can give you some cushioning and and kind of relieve some of that pain but i'm not going to correct that bunion if you come in and you have pain i'm going to give you an anti-inflammatory temporarily, just to try to get relieve some of that swelling in there, some of the pain. Sometimes I'll use a cortisone injection if you're very inflamed. Again, I have to tell patients that the cortisone injection is not going to correct the bunion, but it's just gonna relieve the pain. Orthotics is another modality that we use. That is a custom-made insert for you. It's gonna correct the pronation that occurs to keep the pressure off of the bunion, Again, I have to tell patients when they come in and they say, I don't want surgery, but I'll, I want to try the orthotics. I'm going to tell them I'm not going to correct that bunion, but I'm going to try to slow the progression of that bunion. And if they have treated, they've you know, tried 
conserve treatment options. They're even in these, you know, wide orthopedic shoes and they still have pain. And there are patients that have that. They have the widest orthopedic shoes possible, but their bunion is so painful that I would recommend surgery. Dr. Geekus, real quick, uh, you mentioned Amazon, but where would you suggest to purchase bunion pads? So I do think Amazon does have a good supply of different bunion pads, as long as you understand, again, that we're not correcting the bunion, we're just going to allow you to wear shoes more comfortably. And there's a whole array, but if you look at the upper right-hand side, that's one of the ones I really like a lot because it separates the second toe from the first toe and it protects that um, metatarsal, that first metatarsal where the bunion is. All right, so when would you consider having surgery for a bunion? These are the, the things that I usually talk about with patients. Um, you can consider bunion surgery if you really have pain from your feet every day. If you've tried you know, a reasonable amount of the conservative treatment and nothing's really working for you and you can't manage. Um, and I, you know, it's not a good idea to do bunion surgery preventatively and definitely not for cosmetic reasons. Um, you know, the purpose of bunion surgery is to relieve pain. So if you're, if you have a bunion that doesn't hurt, it's not really going to get all that much better with surgery because it never hurt in the first place. Um, and then preventative purposes is a little bit of a slippery slope. Certainly if the bunion is getting worse quickly, then in some situations doing the bunion correction is simpler before it gets too severe. But most of the time, my recommendation is to try to live with it if you can, and only if you get to the point where you can't, you know, be active and do the things that you want to do, that's when you consider surgery. There are a lot of different bunion correction procedures, so many, like hundreds. Um, so each surgeon, for the most part, has a few that they, um, that they use the most and that they have good success with. So um, I'll briefly talk about the three that I that are my go-to. So the first one is what I use when patients come in with a mild or moderate bunion. It's called a scarf procedure. That's actually a carpentry term based on the way the cut is made in the first metatarsal. And the goal of bunion surgery is actually to perform a realignment of the first metatarsal. The, you can't just go in and cut the bump off because if you look closely, you know, the bump is actually part of the joint. So if you just cut the bump off, you're removing a whole portion of that big toe joint, which is not good for the future. So the better, the, the correct way to correct the bunion is to um, fix the alignment of the first metatarsal here so that it's more parallel to the other metatarsals. And then once the first metatarsal is straight, um, and the ligaments are realigned here, then usually the bunion is corrected nicely. So here's an example of how it looks post-operatively, um, you know, where there are screws in there holding the bone cut together and the big toe is nice and straight. For a more severe bunion like this one, um, I do a procedure called a lapidus procedure, which rather than cut the metatarsal here and straighten it, you actually perform a joint fusion of the joint over here but do it in such a way so that the first metatarsal is again parallel to the second metatarsal, like you can see in this picture. So these are screws here crossing the joint, holding that together. You can see that the joint here, the toe is nice and straight at the end. For patients who have very severe bunions or in cases where there's a bunion and arthritis in the big toe joint that causes pain, then I go ahead and fuse the big toe joint. And in that case, the big toe winds up nice and straight. The downside is that it won't bend from that joint anymore, but in patients who have pain in that joint, that's actually beneficial. And most patients do really well with the surgery. In this patient, there was a, a very severe hammer toe crossing over the big toe. And so that was corrected by shortening the second metatarsal to take away some of the tension and then um, pinning the toe straight temporarily. So you can see that lies nice and straight now. <laughs> Excuse me. The next All right, so now Dr. Gigas, yeah, we'll talk about some flat feet. Sorry. So the next deforming is flat feet or medical term is plez planus. So that's a foot that's very low to no arch. So if you look at that picture on the bottom, you see how the ankle is almost touching the ground. And you know, I'm, I'm surprised at how many people come into my office and they're coming in because they have some kind of problem with their foot, whether it's tendonitis or plantar fasciitis. And they're saying, you know what? Look, I didn't know I had flat feet. Now, you know, 
pointed out to them that's not normal. You know, normally people have somewhat of an arch. So some people say, hey, I, this is my feet all my life. I didn't know that I had this problem, but something then aggravates it or because of having flat feet for such a long period of time, you're gonna have weakness in certain muscles and some tension in other muscles. So an arch is very important for our feet because it helps to distribute the body weight across both the feet and the legs. And the arch has, should be sturdy and flexible so that when you're walking on different surfaces, it can adjust to the different surfaces. When patients come in with very flat feet, not only what they present with, they have pain in their feet, in their ankles, their knees, and sometimes the lower back. Flat feet is either, you know, they're going to, it could be hereditary. So most of the time people, you know, you'll ask people like, does your mom or dad have flat feet? Do they wear orthotics? And normally, you know, they do. It's usually hereditary. Sometimes we'll see it because they have a damage or injury to, to a tendon, mostly the posterior tibial tendon, which is a major inverter of the foot. So when we walk through a gait cycle, each muscle in our, in our leg should be working at a different point during the gait cycle. Well, when you have very flat feet, your posterior tibial tendon is actually kind of working overtime because it's trying to get you to invert instead of evert, and it's working overtime. And so you can have some weakness in that tendon. Sometimes we'll find when we take an x-ray of flat feet that patients will have coalitions. Normally they're born with them um, and that's fusion of the bone, whether it's bone on bone or it's cartilage or it's soft tissue, but we can see flat feet with fusions or it's a nervous or muscular disease. So, so there's certain diseases out there that we will see flat feet in. Rheumatoid arthritis is one of those. And again, genetics is another reason. So treatments for flat feet, depending on what, what the patient comes in with. Is it a tendonitis? I'm going to treat the tendonitis to get the tendonitis better. And then I'm going to recommend that you wear some kind of supportive shoe or an orthotic, right? So very flat feet. I can get rid of the tendonitis by either immobilizing you for a period of time, sending you to physical therapy, or giving you anti-inflammatories. But this this pain is going to keep coming back if I don't do something about that flat arch. So most of the time, you know, a mild flat foot, I can use an over-the-counter orthotic, a little bit more supportive than the Dr. Scholl's that are sold out there, but there's some really good over-the-counter orthotics that can still control some of that abnormal motion. If it's a severe flat foot, I'm going to recommend custom orthotics, which again, we cast your feet, we make the correction on that orthotic to prevent you from rolling over. And, and causing stretching on that arch. So if you look on the bottom, you see the before, see how flat-footed that patient is. Now we make that custom orthotics, we have you stand on it, and you can see that that patient's no longer rolling over. And now, you know, for a period of time, you might still have pain, but within like three to six months, you're gonna find that that pain should resolve. If you have a severely flat foot, and there's a lot of arthritis within that, flat foot and they're not a candidate for surgery, I will put them in an Arizona brace, which if you look on the left-hand side, that's an Arizona brace where I will use that on patients who have severe arthritis from flat feet, or if they have severe weakening of that posterior tibial tendon, that even physical therapy isn't going to get me off to be 100%, I'm going to recommend that. Again, both the custom orthotics and the Arizona brace is not gonna create an arch. It's just gonna have you accommodate, we're gonna kind of make you feel better with that flat arch. And we're gonna try to make an arch while you're wearing it. If all else fails, you've tried supportive shoes, you've tried orthotics, you've tried you know, the Arizona brace, and you're still having a severe amount of pain, I'm gonna recommend surgery. So surgery for flat foot deformity is a complicated balance of soft, soft tissue and bone. So there's a number of procedures that are usually done as a combination to improve the alignment and, um, and bring in extra strength to, to maintain that alignment. So the first step is always to lengthen the calf muscle because the foot is leaning out to the side, the calf muscle actually shortens. And when we go to bring the heel back under the leg, it needs to be longer. So that's why lengthening the calf muscle is always done as a first step. 
then the heel bone gets shifted. So a simple cut and heel bone is performed and then the heel is shifted so that it's more in line with the leg. And then that's usually fixed with, with one or two screws. Next, since the posterior tibial tendon that Dr. Gikas was talking about is not really functional, not really doing its job holding the arch up, we do a tendon transfer and bring in the tendon that lives right behind the posterior tibial tendon, which is called the FDL. That's the tendon that, that's one of the tendons that flexes down the toes aside from the big toe. So that tendon is moved and attached to where the posterior tibial tendon is attached so that the patient still has the ability to invert their ankle and hold their arch up. Sometimes the outer portion of the foot needs to be lengthened um, because the front of the foot can sometimes lean out to the side. And so by putting a bone graft wedge or sometimes a metal wedge in that area, it lengthens the outside and sort of straightens out the foot in that direction. And finally, um, at the end, if it still seems flat, then an arch is created by making a cut on the top of the foot in one of the bones and adding a bone wedge there in order to bend down the foot and create a bit of an arch. So you take a foot like this where the, the toes and the midfoot is really pointing out to the side, um, where those two lines should be pointing at each other in parallel. And this is how it looks afterwards where these are where some of those bone cuts were made and wedges were put in and the lines are essentially parallel at this point. From the side view, you can see that this foot is very flat. Um, you know, the, these two lines are making an angle pointed down, which means that the foot is flat. Those should be parallel. And so after making the cut in the bone here and fixing it with the screws, putting in the bone graft, bone graft with these wedges, um, you can see the alignment is much better and there's a bit of an arch built in. And now we'll talk about how it's limitless. Dr. Shakai, can I just ask you one question? What about a coalition? Sure. When you have like a patient that comes in with a coalition, what type of procedure would you, you do on them? So um, coalition, so again, the coalition is an abnormal connection between two of the bones in the foot. And it's, um, it's a congenital deformity, which means that it happened when you were a kid during development where two of the bones never separated while, when they were supposed to. So in that case, a lot of times kids grow up and their feet are flat their whole lives. And that is more of a rigid flat foot. So if it's not flexible um, and, and um, a combination of the soft tissues and bony procedures are not necessarily gonna be able to move that um, or fix the alignment, either depending on where the coalition is in between which two bones, I can either take the coalition out and correct the alignment and keep it flexible or the joint that the coalition was connecting can actually be fused sometimes in a better position. And in that case, that corrects the alignment and eliminates any pain that patients are getting from that coalition. Thank you. And I just want to remind patients that not every flat foot has a coalition, but sometimes when you take that x-ray, you see that coalition there. And yet you can certainly can try orthotics and should communicate accommodations. But a lot of times, you know, especially a, a child that as they get older, more active, they become painful. So sometimes it's a hard decision for a parent, but I think sometimes they do require surgery. Okay, so the next um, foot pain that we I'll talk about is how it's limited. So remember the bunion that we talked about earlier where you have a bump on the side of the foot. How it's limited usually is a disorder of the great toe joint, again, that large toe joint, and it causes pain and stiffness in that large toe joint. So sometimes we call it like a dorsal bunion because the bump happens on the top of the foot. This is also a progressive condition, which eventually, if it goes to the end stage, you get no motion in that joint at all. And then when that, when you have no motion in that joint, it's called the hallux rigidus. And that's usually when the patient comes in and they have absolutely no motion and they really have pain on other areas of their foot because they don't have the motion that they need in their large toe joint. And so now they're, comp they're compensating for that lack of motion and they're putting a lot more weight on other areas of the foot. Next slide. So 
the large toe joint requires 65 degrees of motion for us to be able to ambulate through gait, right? So if you don't have that motion, first of all, you're going to ha start having pain in that large toe joint and then eventually throughout your whole body. So the early symptoms, normally the first time a patient will come in is they say, I have some pain, some swelling in that great toe joint. Sometimes it feels like it locks up. And anytime I put my big toe up, I have pain. They'll come in, they might have swelling or it might just be that they have pain in there. Sometimes they'll say, you know, I have pain and I can hear like a grinding. Next slide. So that how it's limited is just like a, a bunion deformity. Could be hereditary. It could be caused from an injury. I'll have patients come in and say, you know, they had a large toe injury years ago, or they dropped something on it, never did anything about it. And they could have had a fracture there that didn't heal in the proper position. It also could be from structural deformity in the bone. So if we have like a, a high arched foot, Sometimes they'll have an elevated first metatarsal, which then also takes that motion that you should have there, that 65 degrees away, and you're not getting that whole, that 65 degrees that you actually need. So when we have that limited motion in there, what happens is your toe tries to get that motion and it starts hitting that little spur that's there. That, that chronic hitting of that spur is going to start slowly wear away at the cartilage in that toe joint and a bone spur will occur. And that's when the patients really have the pain. The treatment here, again, the conservative treatment is, again, always shoe modification. So I think if everything, anything you've heard all tonight is the first thing I'm always going to say is we're going to talk about your shoes. What type of shoes do you wear? I need you to get into wider and deeper shoes right? So what the width needs to be wide, but the depth needs to be wide enough, high enough so that it doesn't put pressure on there. So now we're talking about orthopedic shoes. Also a stiff or rocker bottom sole shoe. So a rocker bottom sole shoe, a lot of your running sneakers have rocker bottom. If you look at the sole on the bottom, on the, on the bottom in the forefoot area, it kind of comes up a little bit, almost like it looks like a, the bottom of a rocking chair. And so that, those type of shoes, if you don't have that motion in that great toe joint, it will, that shoe's going to help you get some of that motion. There are a lot of good rocker bottom shoe, shoes out there. You can either Google them, but I know for like a good new, like sneaker, it would be a New Balance 928, 880, and 1080s are really great rocker bottom soles. If you like a Maximus type of sneaker, there's the Hoka 1-1. The problem with the Hoka 1-1 is they're kind of like a lot of, there's a lot of sole on there. So it's a little higher and people don't like it because it's just too much of a sole. If the shoe modifications don't work and you're not ready for surgery, I'm going to say orthotics. I, again, make custom orthotics. They're going to be different than the flat foot orthotics. They're going to be different than the bunion orthotics. I'm going to kind of offload that first metatarsal and get you to have that. that you, the orthotic is going to make you think that you're getting that 65 degrees of motion, but it's not necessarily getting it. The other, here's the shoe that we we're talking about, that new balance. If you look at the sole, it kind of rolls up in the forefoot, so it helps you get that motion that you need. If you come in and you have a lot of pain in that great toe joint, and it's like, you know, you're not ready for surgery, you're, you're wearing the wider shoes, or you might have been like doing too much running or playing tennis or, or you know, doing some kind of activity that could have aggravated that condition, I'll try some anti-inflammatories or a cortisone injection. I always remind patients again, that cortisone injection and that anti-inflammatory isn't going to get rid of the deformity, but it's going to help you, you know, be able to work through that pain and eventually take away the inflammation and the pain. If you have tried everything and nothing has worked, I'm going to recommend surgery. Okay, so surgery for hallux rigidus or hallux limitus, which are synonyms. Um, involves sometimes just addressing that bone spur and sometimes addressing the arthritis that's involving the whole joint. So in some cases, uh, we will do a procedure called a chelectomy, which means uh, removal of bone spur. So it's actually quite straightforward. We go in, shave down the bone spur, make sure it's nice and smooth, um, and that's it. And that increases range of motion, um, the recovery is really pretty straightforward because it's not a big operation. Um, 
The only problem with it is that it doesn't really address the underlying arthritis that's within the joint. It's a very effective operation at um, relieving pain on the top of the toe from that spur, but if any of the pain is coming from the arthritis deep within the joint, it's not really great at relieving that. It can improve the motion also, which is nice. So that's one option. Um, if the arthritis is really severe, like you can see in this joint where there's essentially no space left in the joint whatsoever, then I'll recommend a joint fusion like we talked about for really severe bunions. Um, in that case, the joint is um, cleaned out and then the two ends of the bone are connected together. I usually use the plate and screws and then sometimes an extra screw like that. Um, the bone spurs are all removed as well. Sometimes I'll add a little bone graft. Um, and then um, the joint fuses together, it doesn't move anymore, but it didn't really move much to begin with in most cases. Um, and um, the pain relief is significant once it heals. There is a third option, a joint replacement option. It's relatively new. It's this little sort of um, synthetic material made of the same material as contact lenses. And um, this can be implanted and acts like a spacer, keeping the two ends of the bone away from each other. The nice um, part about this implant is that it, it um, allows you to keep whatever range of motion you have while keeping the two arthritic ends of the bone away from each other. But in practice, the, the success rate is not as good as we initially thought. You know, for the first studies that came out about it showed about an 80% success rate, but in reality, it seems like the success is only 50-50. So I still think that the joint fusion is the better option, um, but the replacement or the, you know, the spacer option is there as well. Um, and it's always something that we have a conversation about and come to a decision together. Now we'll talk about hammer toes. Rachel, I know I, I know we don't use this at Rothman, but I have a lot of patients that come in and ask about, you know, the joint replacement that you know, they were, you're actually taking part of that bone out and putting it like either a silicone or any other replacement. Can you just touch, like I know I have, you know, told patients that there's not a big success rate with that. And a lot of times what happens when you use that surgical procedure, you know, they're cutting part of the bone off. And so if that fails, you really will end up with a shortened toe. Have you seen that happen? Unfortunately, yeah. Even even when a lot of the bone is not removed, um, but a, a metal implant, for example, is placed over time, it, it grinds down the bone and the big toe becomes shortened, which not only is a cosmetic issue, but if the big toe is too short, then you wind up putting a lot of pressure through the ball of your foot, through the other metatarsals, and it can create hammer toes and other problems there. And then the surgery to fix that is complicated because not only do you have to remove the implant and perform a fusion at that point, but you also have to lengthen the toe again, which can be complicated, can require using grafts from cadavers. Um, so I, in general, patients who have the joint fused do really well. This joint does really well fused, even though it does take away motion. Um, I, I, if the arthritis is bad enough, that's really my go-to and, and the gold standard. Um, but if anything, if, if the patient really wants to keep the motion, then the, the one benefit of this implant is that it doesn't really take away a lot of bone and it can be very easily converted to a fusion, you know, if it is in the 50% group that fails. Yeah, I agree with you, Rachel. I see too many patients who come in that have a failed joint replacement, you know, from any type of outside, you know, whether, whether it's silicone or it's metal. And, and then you really don't have much left to offer them because you have to take that out. And as Rachel, Dr. Shaketa said, we, you know, we, she then has to lengthen it. Uh, and the patients really, you know, they're coming in with severe pain on second, third, and fourth metatarsal. And to correct the pain in the second, third, and fourth, you've got to take that implant out. And, and then it leaves a shortened toe. So I just wanted to touch base with that because I know I get a lot of patients who ask that question. So thank Definitely, you. Definitely, yeah. So the next deformity is a hammer toe. And, you know, we touched base about that when we saw that um, 
bunion deformity. And sometimes you don't have a bunion deformity, but you just have a single hammer toe. And the digits I normally see hammer toe, most common is the second or the fifth digit, you know, the little digit or the one next to the big toe. And it's like a contraction deformity. So that digit starts contracting usually at the proximal interphalangeal joint. It can start out that it's flexible. So when I touch it, I can push it down and it, and it goes back down. Eventually it will become rigid and then I can't push it back down. Normally the patient comes in and says, you know, it hurts when I, when I put shoes that rub on it or I get a corn on there or, you know, I wear my shoes and it gets real red and swollen and then sometimes I get a burning sensation. And sometimes they'll even get like, sense, like a burning sensation back of the joint in the second metatarsal phalangeal joint. Um, next slide, please. So a hammer toe can be caused by injury. So if you had a fracture and you didn't treat the fracture to the toe, it could kind of end up in a hammer toe deformity. It could be caused by patients who wear tight shoes. So if we're wearing a lot of tight, narrow shoes or high heels, we could put pressure and make them start contracting. It could also be an imbalance in the muscles or tendons or the ligaments. So there are ligaments on our toes and there's muscles and tendons. And if they're imbalanced, if one side of the, the toe ligament is weaker, the other side is going to pull it. It's going to create a hammer toe. Or if the flexor tendons overpower the extensor tendons or vice versa, we're going to see a hammer toe. It's also, like I said, hereditary, or as we saw earlier, the bunion, the progressive bunion that starts shifting over and goes underneath of that second toe and lifts it up. So treatment, usually for flexible hammer toes, I can use some pads. Or, or some splints. So if you look on the left-hand side, that's a toe sleeve. And again, you can find them on Amazon. It's something that you just put over the toe. So when you're wearing a shoe, it protects you from the shoe and doesn't put pressure on it. On the right-hand side, that's a toe crest pad. You put it underneath of the toes. And so as you step down, again, it has to be a flexible hammer toe. As you step down, it straightens out that toe. You wanna wear wider and deeper toe box shoes. So that if you have a rigid one and you don't want to go to surgery, I'm going to recommend that you start buying SAS shoes, which are wider and orthopedic type of shoe or wider sneakers that accommodate deformity. If you want surgery, then I'm going to send you off to the surgeon. So here's an example of a severe hammer toe. I actually think just the same picture we looked at before where you can see um, this, for example, is like a relatively normal toe. It's a little hammered at the end, but you can see the joint clearly. Here, you can't see the joint because the toe's actually gotten so severe that it's dislocated and it's sitting up on top of the metatarsal. So the surgery for this patient involves straightening the big toe. You have to get the bunion straight in order to get the big toe out of the way. So the second toe has a place to sit. And then second metatarsal is shortened, um, so it will become more in line with where the third metatarsal is. So, um, and then it's usually fixed with a little screw right there. Um, and then the joint that's bent is taken out and pins are passed through temporarily to hold the position. I usually leave the pins in for about six weeks. And then after all of a sudden, all of a sudden done, the toe is usually nice and straight. Um, and in much better alignment. Sometimes they can drift over time, but for the most part, they stay in a much better position than where they started. There you go. Next deformity is neuroma. So a neuroma is like a painful inflammation or swelling of a nerve in the foot. We normally see it on between the, it's going to be the third and fourth toe, and it's the nerve that's between the third and fourth metatarsals. So patients will come in and they'll say, you know, I have pins and needles or numbness in two of my toes. It feels like I have a rolled up sock underneath of my foot, or I feel like there's a pebble in it. Once I take off my shoe and rub it, the pain resolves. I don't get that pins and needles. If I don't wear shoes, I don't have it. As that neuroma grows larger, there's, you're going to have pins and needles more often. And even sometimes just by wearing socks, you're going to have it. Next slide. So there's a number of different reasons why you can have it. Again, we're talking about shoes. It seems like every deformity we've talked about tonight is about mm -hmm. shoes. If you wear a lot of narrow shoes or high heels that push those metatarsals together, the metatarsals are going to hit that nerve and it's going to cause inflammation to that area. 
Also, if you ever had any trauma or injury to the nerve, and it could just be trauma or injury from repetitive trauma. So if you're a runner or you play basketball or volleyball and you constantly repetitive stress to that area, we can then cause some inflammation on that. Treatment consists with padding. And now here, you see the pads right directly on the foot, but that's just to show you where we would put the pad. The pad, I normally put the pad in the shoe so that it's not directly on the foot. It kind of lifts up the metatarsals and tries to separate the metatarsals so that pressure is not on the nerve. We'll try some shoe modifications, again, wearing wider shoes. Try some anti-inflammatories to see if we can decrease that inflammation. If the pad works and the patient is willing to go for, you wear the pad all the time, I'm gonna say, well, we can make an orthotic that we can put the pad on it so that insert, that orthotic goes into your shoes and you won't have to keep replacing that pad. Also, cortisone injections do work on aromas. What, what I'll do is I'll send you out for an ultrasound to evaluate to make sure it is an aroma where it is in your foot. Kind of, They can look at it and then if it's there, they can then inject you with some cortisone. So it's right directly on the neuroma. That normally helps. I tell patients if the neuroma is present and one cortisone injection hasn't helped, you may try the second one, but I'm pretty sure it's not going to work. So if you've tried modifying your shoes, you've tried pads, you've tried cortisone, you've tried anti-inflammatories, and you still have that feeling, and we know that there's a cortisone, that we know that there's an aroma there, we're going to then recommend some surgery. So um, the one thing I will add also is that a lot of patients have heard about alcohol injections to ablate the nerve, but the literature does not really support that. So at least here at the Rothman Institute, we do not recommend that. And we do try to limit the number of injections in that area because the cortisone is not that healthy for the soft tissue. And if you do many injections with cortisone in that area, it can actually weaken some of the ligaments and sometimes the toes can start to um, move around and become um, hammer toes. So we, that's why we really limit the number of injections in that area. But confirming an aroma on an ultrasound is really important. Ultrasound is much more sensitive at detecting the aromas than an MRI. So some patients will come and see me and they'll have an MRI that shows an aroma, but I'll still usually send them to get the ultrasound so I can confirm um, that it's truly there. So the surgery for neuroma, again, is relatively simple. Um, it involves excising that nerve. Um, then the nerve itself is what's inflamed and thickened. And so by removing the nerve, it takes away the pain. Patients will have numbness as well, but it's not usually bothersome. And over time, it seems like some of the other nerves come in and sort of cross cover that toe so that the numbness seems to decrease with time. The pain relief after the surgery is excellent. Um, so if all else fails, the surgery is a really good option. And the last topic we're gonna talk about is plantar fasciitis. Thanks. And, and this is, you know, probably I see a lot of this in my practice every day. Um, it's one of the most common causes of heel pain, and I'm sure everyone knows someone who's had plantar fasciitis, or you may have had a bout of plantar fasciitis. So the plantar, plantar fascia is a ligament that's on the bottom of the foot, and inserts into the heel bone, which is called the calcaneus, and it goes all the way to the front of the foot. It supports the arch, and it absorbs the shock and stress. So as we're walking, that plantar fascia absorbs the stress and strain as we're walking. Repetitive stretching of that plantar fascia causes irritation at the, at the where it inserts into the heel area. And sometimes, you know, repetitive stress and you haven't done anything about it and it just gets worse, we're going to see some micro tears there. Next slide. Symptoms, typical symptoms are they, the patient will come in, they say, I have pain when I first get up in the morning. And as I start walking, some of the pain starts resolving. I'll also have pain when I sit down and I get back up from a sitting position or I'm driving home from work, I get out of the car and I have extreme pain. Patients will also get it when they stand for long periods of time. So any patient who stands on their feet at work for long periods of time, at the end of the day, they'll start experiencing that pain in that plantar fascia. Normally, uh, you know, you'll see patients who are runners will come in and say, you know, I started having this pain after I ran, not during the run. 
You know, is that common? No, it shouldn't. When you're a runner, you shouldn't have pain in the plantar fascia when you stop running. So something's happening. There's repetitive stress on there. You're irritating that area. If these runners don't stop running, it eventually will cause them to have pain throughout the running and then they have to stop running. Next slide. Risk factors. So right now with the pandemic occurring, a lot of patients are working from home. They have gained weight because they haven't been able to work out or they're not wearing any shoes or they're just wearing socks around the house. So those are kind of like some risk factors with this. Also, age. So as we get older, sometimes our feet flatten out and that puts more stretch and strain on that plantar fascia. Also, certain foot types are going to have more tendency to get plantar fasciitis. So you're going to see it in very flat feet and you're going to see it very high arched feet or anyone who has abnormal biomechanics. You'll see it in any person who does a lot of high impact activities such as long distance running or any job that requires you to stand for long periods of time on hard floors. Patients who will come in and say, look, I had these sneakers for two years. They're always been good. Why am I all of a sudden having plantar fasciitis? Well, sneakers and shoes are only meant to last a certain amount of time. And I'll tell my runners that you should be replacing your sneakers every 300 to 500 miles. That sole, that EVA, that compound that absorbs the shock after 500 miles no longer absorbs that shock. So what's happening as you're doing these high impact activities, the shock is going right into the heel and into your ankle and throughout your body. So we really want to make sure that patients come in. I'm going to evaluate everything. I'm going to ask you, what do you do for a living? What do you do for exercise? What type of shoes are you wearing? Are you working from home? Are you wearing shoes in the house? The other thing when we see patients with plantar fasciitis, they normally have tight Achilles tendon. So we've got to address that tight Achilles tendon along with addressing the plantar fasciitis. Next slide. Treatment, of course, is rest. We're going to stop all high impact activities for a period of time. I'm going to give you a stretching program. So if you look here, the woman is pushing against the wall. She's actually stretching that outside of the Achilles tendon. We got to stretch the Achilles tendon, loosen that up. We then have to stretch the plantar fascia. So I'm going to give you some plantar fascia stretching exercises. And if you look at the bottom there, the patient is kind of grasping that towel. It's stretching that plantar fascia. I'm also going to start you on an anti-inflammatory if you have such great amount of pain. I'm going to recommend that you stay out. Stay. If you're working from home, I don't want you to be barefoot. I don't want you to wear slippers. I don't want you to wear just socks. I want you to really wear your sneakers that have a good support in them. Next slide. I'm also going to ask you to think about doing some Physical therapy, if you've tried that stretching and it hasn't worked, I'm gonna ask you to go to physical therapy, which is gonna include this Graston therapy, which is a deep massage with an instrument. It's very painful, but it does work. Most of the time, plantar fasciitis, if we can correct the, the shoes that you're wearing, if you're not wearing the proper shoes, if we get you to stretch and you really do a stretch, I'll tell patients, just because you stretch once isn't going to correct this. It didn't happen overnight. So you've got to give me about four to six weeks of stretching before we can see if you're even going in the right direction. If you have biomechanical abnormalities, flat feet or cavus foot, I'm going to recommend orthotics also. And again, orthotics, each different foot deformity is going to have a different orthotic. Night splints. Patients will come in and talk about night splints. So night splints keep your foot in a 90 degree angle so it doesn't stretch the plantar fascia and the Achilles tendon. And most patients say it, they cannot wear it all night long, but they can wear it for a couple hours before they can take it off. That also helps. So if we, again, if we can get you to do conservative treatments, most of the time it works. If it's really bad and you cannot walk and you don't have time for surgery, I will immobilize you for a period of time. But after I take you out of that boot, I'm still going to recommend physical therapy because I have to address the tightness in the Achilles tendon and the plantar fascia. My last resort is the cortisone shot. I don't like getting cortisone shot for plantar fasciitis because there's always a chance that you could rupture that plantar fascia. And so what happens when you rupture that plantar fascia, you're really in a boot for about six weeks. So you've really, you know, kind of done more damage than good. 
The cortisone is used just to decrease the inflammation right at the insertion of the, of the plantar fascia. It's still not addressing that tightness or your biomechanical abnormality. If that does not work, I will then send you to surgery. So um, the good news about plantar fasciitis is that more than 90% of cases resolve with all of that conservative treatment, but the bad news is it usually takes at least nine months, and some people say up to 18 months. So if you're in that category where it has not gotten better, uh, plantar fascia release can be performed surgically, which can relieve your symptoms in 97% of patients. Uh, the technique I use is the endoscopic technique, which means that I make two little incisions along either side of the heel. And on one side, I put a small camera, and then the other side, a small knife, and cut two thirds of the plantar fascia, leaving one third of it intact so that there's still some support of the arch. Um, and that is really effective at, at taking the pain away. It can take a few months after surgery for it to work, but most patients do really well if all else fails. So we want to thank you so much for joining us for this webinar um, from your two uh, neighborhood Mainline Today top doctors. And um, if you want to stay on with us a little longer, we are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Yes, thank you, Dr. Shaked and Dr. Geekis. You both gave us excellent uh, information here, answered a lot of questions, um, but there are a few that still came in. Um, again, if anyone has any questions at the bottom of the screen, there's a little tab you can select and type it in there um, under Q&A. We are um, just past the time slot, so we're going to go through these quickly though, okay? Um, first question, what treatment options exist for peripheral neuropathy in the feet to eliminate painful tingling? Um, Dr. Kikis, do you want to take that one? So peripheral neuropathy in the feet could be caused by many different reasons, right? So one of the biggest ones is diabetes. So if you have diabetes and your A1C is above a seven, I'm going to say because it's, you know, tighter control of your sugars, talking with your endocrinologist or your internist can help that. Neuropathy also could be caused from a radiculopathy from your back. So first you've got to identify why you have neuropathy and then address that. There really isn't anything out there that gets that painful burning from neuropathy out unless you can figure out why you have it. There are cases where it's called idiopathic neuropathy for no reason at all. And those neuropathies are very difficult to treat because you know, we don't know what causes that neuropathy. So we can't address it. Uh, sometimes when you, you know, talk to your, your primary care physician, they can put you on something what's called neurotin or gabapentin um, or Lyrica. It's not you know, specifically for the nerves, but they found that it does help relieve some of that. Thank you. Uh, next question. I have midfoot arthritis and I'm trying to avoid surgery by wearing custom orthotics. Which custom orthotics are better? orthotics molding from placing your foot in a box of foam or the plaster mold? That pain. I'm going to answer that. Um, so, Pete, the, the, there are different trains of thought for the custom mold of orthotics. When I make a custom mold of orthotics, and I think this is what we do at, at Rothman, and I think we do a good job at it, is we put you in the neutral position. That's the position that your foot should be functioning in. And we mold you, we cast you in that position. When you step into a, a, a foam box, you're actually capturing the way you're walking. And then they try to correct it from there. If I can put you in the neutral position and then make the correction there, I think that's a better orthotic. Um, sorry, did I interrupt? No. Okay. Um, I developed drop foot in both feet. Can you give some information on how to, how it can be treated? Foot drops, um, can be managed either without surgery or with surgery. There are a few different types of braces that can be used. Uh, some are, um, like pre-made braces, like a carbon fiber brace that helps to hold the foot up. Um, and then there are custom molded ones. There's a plastic molded one that holds your foot up so that when you're walking, you're not going to trip on your feet. Um, and there's all different versions of those that you can try. Um, and then depending on which muscles are working and which are not working in your leg, um, there are surgical, surgical options where you can 
move tendons around in your ankle, um, you know, you move a tendon that's functional to the front of your ankle, and then that will help you pull your foot up. Um, it sort of depends, you know, there's no two cases of foot drop are really the same. So um, it's really important to have a good physical exam and sometimes a neurologic exam as well. What causes corns on the bottom of the feet? Is it a sign of another condition? So um, corns are usually because of pressure. Um, so if there's a malalignment within your foot where um, there's, you know, for example, in the case of a bad bunion where the big toe is not really in the right spot and you're not, when you're walking, you're not putting the weight through the big toe the way you're supposed to, then patients will sometimes get corns and calluses under the foot, under the ball of the foot um, by the smaller toes. And that's just because the pressure is being routed to a different spot in your foot than the foot is made for. So um, sometimes it also means that your calf muscle is too tight and so calf stretching can be helpful. Um, so that's another one where, um, you know, it, it depends on how your foot is and, and a good physical exam would be able to identify um, what the problem is. Okay. Um, just so you know, this is being recorded, so I'm going to send it out to everybody. So if you missed any part of it, you can go back and watch it or send it to people that you know that need this information. Um, last question, are super feet a good OTC orthotic? Is it better to use the half or full sole in a sneaker? Uh, yeah, I think that the super feet do make a good product. And if you look at the super feet, you know, you usually can get them, I think, in any good running store. I think Dick's might have them also. But there are different types of super feet. So make sure you get the type for your foot deformity. Um, and, you know, it depends on what type of shoe you're going to wear them. If you're going to wear them as a sneaker, you want the full length, right? Because you're going to take the insert the existing insert out and then put that in. If you're going to wear them in like dress shoes or your everyday work shoes, probably the three quarter is better. Um, again, there are different over the counter ones. That's a good product. Power Steps is another good one. So there, it, Power Steps is a little different than them. It's, it's not as hard, but there's a rear foot post on it, which controls it. But, um, you know, it depends on what you're using them for and what deformity you have. But if you have plantar fascia, I think both Power Steps and Super Feet are a good product out there. Great. Thank you, uh, both of you, Dr. Gikas, Dr. Shaked. Um, again, if you need to make an appointment with either of them, they are at Glen Mills, Media, Malvern, and South Philly. The um, phone number to get them is 610-480-6584. Uh, um, and I will be record, or I did record this, so I'll be sending it out to each of you uh, later this week. So uh, if you have to reference back to it at all. So thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.